um, these three poems respond to um, novels that my father read to me when I was a pretty young child. They're Victorian novels. I did not really understand them when he read them to me. And this book is, um, I wrote it after he died as a kind of way to reclaim my relationship with him and to also revisit the work for the presence of women in the material. So I'm going to try to read a little bit from each one. Um, the first one is called Romance, and it's from a novella called Eve's Ra Ransom by George Gissing, who was a kind of a more realist, late Victorian novelist. All life, sets upon, all life sets itself upon us like a dull, iron-colored grief. And the discipline is to realize that we haven't died yet. In the story, the protagonist has no basis for hope. In the story, the protagonist ends with a shout of joy. And we believe this exclamation. Yet it is hard, very difficult, to understand from whose point of view the story is told, to understand that neutrality functions as sympathy. The difficulty of understanding is so large that the character must put its hands out to hold up its head and must furrow its brow. It must be willing to wait indefinitely. It must be willing to misunderstand itself as a means of surviving. It must understand that its recklessness is indeed reckless, even when it is absurdly modest. It must be able to turn itself into a different character entirely, and this trait or capability will become known as love. The romance is full of legacies, slight, often bitter inheritances. A beguiling photograph in the landlady's album, but no more specific than that. A chance meeting, meeting on the train platform where the debtor, flush with wealth, pays off his debt to the impoverished man. This sudden wealth, this payment of debt is meant to humiliate the man to whom the money is owed. The countryside undulating with industrial waste. This life. And so the character resolves, and so the character says over and over, I am going to live. I am going to live. As though he were tutoring himself in an expression from a foreign language phrase book. How does a human soul curdle? Perhaps by self-abduction. The consistency of the soul loses its satin texture when it learns options. It may take itself away. It may demand a ransom. Um, so now I'm going to read something from The Woman in White, which if you have not read, you should read, because it is the best novel I have ever read, and I've read it many times. Um, and I was interested in reclaiming in this book the ways that um, the woman's body is uh, equates with the land, and the idea of creating a sort of pastoral around, around that. The pastoral lies diaphanous upon itself, pale tissue pulled from within. There is no secrecy, only swathing, the consolation of the flat world. Tissue of consolation on the wan field, wandering, what the narrator thought was a flawless passivity was not. Shush. Mist. What the narrator supposed was perfect was the creature wrapped in its white fur, struggling soundlessly in the trap. Hence the field makes white snow to fall upon itself, blemishless, tugged from her roughened throat the asylum, uh, the asylum of the open air smothers, mouth as lair. The white words that came from that place rely no further victim on their flesh, a veil whose fine mesh hemmed them in. Terrain 
woman's flesh lovingly impounded, beautiful field, bastardy, these many forms of seizure. Once, and sighted again, hush. The blanket crocheted itself over the sloping plain, and all was woolly and opaque, not to be perturbed. Portent, sharp consonant, softened to omen, muffled. And here, then, the peculiar indirection, a simple cry, or relative wilderness. The abductor gently pried open the creature's mouth from which he tugged the woolly thread that paralleled her, from which he took her colorless tongue, from which he took her, from which he pulled an endless length of peerless fleece, from which he laid as he lied upon the purity of the shawl that bound her as she was, from which her pure docility became a virtue. Blushed this organ of fidelity. Aches white paving posing as tame. Culprit, captor, cataloger of passion cannot chase a circle. Love's catalyst Hence is the crashing of layers, one impressing another. The object is scoured of defining char characteristics, fugitive. We see her only from behind, and she is all alike. Doubling, all undone, her or her, white membranous rind slips, burnt away. At once, the creature's pelt embraces itself and all its kind. The land's grace incarcerates, redoubles itself. The forlorn figure turns toward and turns toward inkling, innocent imposture, soft little animal, mild pelt it once wore. Diaphanous skeleton she lifts to ward off the several Blows who constitute world, gown, endless downy lawn. And then I'll read just a few parts from the Moonstone. Decorum. One wishes the surface were as pleasant to the finger as it is to the eye. Perhaps one can never touch it. Perhaps one is touched too much. She was ugly. She was beautiful. Her appearance was altered. One shoulder was raised above another and made of her a freak, or her lovely lips were compressed and drained of color, always to be called lesser. In a realm in which one's reason is continually partaken of and one's reason is ever modeled with skepticism, just as the surface is modeled with secrets. Look how the feminine boot print leads to the shore and not back from it. How the landscape shimmies with this tide. Alas, the shore is soaked through and through with what one knows but does not tell. The courtesy of it, as it turns to quicksand, receptive, that is, to the weight of the visitor, blurring the footprint politely as it harries the rain. Surface. Clairvoyance, too, bears some relation to the surface, to see thus, flying as the crow flies. So one is enabled to make mere surface out of indisposition and arrive. One need not embroider the fabric, nor even sew its panels together, for the eye flies as a veil over the body, never immodest, but simply in true relation to truth. Each party pauses, moving away from the object of its desire, and so the terrain is clarified. Each narrator makes tensile the cordage that marks his or her terrain, and from above, the eye cannot help but note the pretty pattern that stands out in their overlap. It remains nonetheless a barren sight. Clairvoyance would appall the truth by refusing to keep its secrets. The eye flies over the naked body, yes, but sees only skin, sees the forms of travel, the formula partaken of by those who attempt to escape.
clairvoyance then as a sense of humor, its own map. That is, the ability to read the skin, its legend of hush and pallor, the true body, the one which despite all its acumen cannot get away. Sleepwalking. The idea is to reenact what you did, but cannot rec recollect that you have done. The purpose is to walk over the very surface of sleep as Christ walked over the surface of the water, and all along, riptide and quicksand hissing through the windows. The physician promises a form of restitution, and this he offers by way of smoothing the text that covers the page. He does this with his own speculative interpolations. He offers that he will soon die, and so, it is, and so is at liberty to experiment freely. Soon you will be walking in the dark, buoyant upon it. Soon you will relinquish the habits that consoled you. No matter that they filled your lungs, but the breath, too, is just a taste of the facade that fronts the atmosphere. The physician offers you a means of relinquishing the guilt that has been your enduring companion. To do so, you must once again smudge the white fabric of your ship, disrupt the paint that would have covered the threshold. Who is it that levitates over the tide as the Savior is reported to have done? Who dwindles in consciousness as though slumber's helium could lock the perpetrator over pain? The last. Decorum. Our decorum is happiness deferred. Our coastline is unsteady. Decorum is of the beloved, in transit around the beloved. Stealthier, this than actual pursuit. Our witness must profess us and then die. Our adjudicator shall remove himself to exile. Our servant recuse himself. Our camouflage, our jewel, is lost to us forever. So we end. This is our trough. As the somnambulant gropes towards the site of loss, his beloved looks on in polite and silent bliss. Thank you.